On this installment of Creative Cabin Fever, I am joined by local legend Tony Kelly. Now, a lot of people know Tony as a comedian. A lot of people know Tony as an incredible podcaster full of mindfulness and wisdom. A lot of people know Tony because he's about to launch a character that's been living in his head rent free for many, many years into a movie called The Hurler. But a lot of people might not know the Tony that I've known for as long as I've known. So Tony Kelly, welcome to Creative Cabin Fever. How are you? I'm okay, Rebecca. How are you? I am good. We, we're all aware that I have injured my back thanks to lifting that stereo in the background. But uh, outside of that, we're doing good. Good. That's good. A back can always be rested. I think so. We're getting there. We're getting there, you know? <laughs> so you were just about wrapped up the hurler or have you wrapped it up? Or, no. Okay. No, we've, we've, we've finished week one. We have two full weeks and a couple of little days then after that left. So we're we're almost a third of the way there. I want to say a third of the way there because it sounds like there's not not as much left to do. But yeah, we, we're about a third of the way there on principal photography. Yeah, obviously then there's loads of back end stuff and differential stuff. Yeah, but that's really exciting because obviously there's been a project that you've been working on for a very, very long time, far longer than most people probably realize. And it took funny turns because everything in the world took funny turns over the last while, right? So. Sure. I'm super excited to see it finally come to fruition for you. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's been mad. Uh, I got a, a, a memory on my on my Facebook there a few weeks ago uh, from 2011, uh, from when I originally came up with the with the concept of the character. And then, obviously, for anyone who knows, um, you know, it was it was originally a web based show in 2013, and then we did another episode in New York in 2016. That was supposed to be um, like a full season, and then I got I got picked up for a development deal with a, a certain certain channel, and uh, it didn't it didn't work out the way that I we both I suppose had had wanted to attend. We caught toys, and then it was then it was something else in the states, and uh, yeah, and it just it's jumped through many hoops, and the, and the film the film in particular has been in the in the works for four years or more actually. And uh, it was a play in between that and COVID and all. It's yeah, it's been a journey. It's been over over ten years of a journey to get here. Yeah, and I was actually one of the last performances I was able to go to before the world shifted and changed was yourself in Garter Lane. Oh wow! And it was an incredible. I brought a friend with me, and it was just such a laugh out loud experience. And you slayed it as a one man show on a stage. You really, really made that whole come to life, and I loved every bit of it. So to see that transform again from one idea to another idea that then was other ideas and then four years of planning for a thing that then would evolve and change again to be where you are that's pretty spectacular tony yeah i i actually had forgotten that you were there that's that's class fair play uh and yeah it, it was cool and i'm just looking actually just as we're talking about it, this thing i have in the background is is an award that i won in uh in la in in universal studios in hollywood which was mental a mental journey in 2015 for, for playing gar um so i just actually realized as you were talking there that that's what that is hanging in the background there so it's yeah it's it's been a journey with this guy he he lives in my head rent free um and has done for about i don't know how many years 10 years maybe it's crazy so how did he start going there rent free like what was the kind of clicking moment where he started appearing or do you even kind of remember how it happened what was the process yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I was in film school in, in New York in, in 2009, we were all tasked with making a short, like from, from scratch to end, and you had to do everything. You had to, you had to write it, you had to direct it, uh, you had to edit it. You know, you had to just basically do everything with it. And um, a lot of the lads in the class were making like these arty film, stu- film school like shorts and uh less focus on narrative more focus on style and stuff like that and and i just wanted to make something funny like i, I was there to try and learn how to produce produce my own comedy movies that's what i, I originally wanted to do and I, I suppose i suppose after nearly 15 years i'm getting there but um yeah and you know it was i was at the new york film academy which was amazing and i just came up with this character uh, I, I've been a huge fan of mockumentaries I, I, nearly all my life, I think, you know, from Spinal Tap to The Office to uh, all the other Christopher Guest stuff. And then uh, even stylized stuff like Arrested Development, which isn't technically a mockumentary, but it's shot like one. And 
you know, I could go on for forever. Like even up to the, lo- the stuff the Lonely Island guys do then, which I researched a lot for the movie. But anyway, look, I, I, I'm boring people now, but like I wanted to make something like that in, in film school. And I came up with this character who was who was a singer in a band in, in Ireland and was coming to America. And he thought he was going to be, and it was so long ago, he, he thought he was coming to basically be like this superstar in America, but someone was after backing him to be a backing singer or something like that. And his name was Jeff Shanagari. And uh, he was originally Gar, really. You know, it was, it was a way to kind of, I don't know, maybe plot through my personality multiplied by 500 million. Uh, and kind of like put all the, I suppose, insecurities and maybe just like things that you suspect other people think of you into a character and then try to bash them down by teaching him a lesson. And then it's it's very, I think it's very internal, the more I've looked at it, especially the last year or so. But anyway, so Jeff was really the first kind of thing. And that that's actually how I started in stand-up as well. This was, I'm so old that this is before everything was youtube and stuff like that and uh people it, it kind of went viral in the school people were burning copies of the dvd which for anyone who's under probably 35 yeah i won't know what that is people were burning the dvds and giving them to each other and it was a really silly little thing but it just was i think it was i guess it was just different for for a film school or whatever and the uh, the dvd found its way into the hands of a guy called stephen rosenfield who was a comedy producer in uh, in new york and he, and he broke me into stand up after seeing after seeing jeff shanagari and i suppose then from there i came home about 4 years later yeah about 4 years later um having obviously graduated film school broken into stand up done stand up tours opened for some great names and gotten and, and done my own tour and, and made an album and just done some really cool stuff in the, in the world of stand up and, and, you know, and, and I had done a couple of movies as an actor and I, I found myself back home in Waterford. My visa had expired. I had no money. I, I, everyone else had kind of moved on and I, I had no visa and I didn't know what to do. And I, everyone were talking about web series in the States. Nobody was talking about them here. And I'd seen, I'd seen a GA documentary about this guy and, I thought it was what the hurler ended up being. I was like, this guy can't be real, but whoever the comedian is that's doing this is a genius. And I, I asked the, the lads, who, who is this? And they were like, this is a real, this is a real documentary. So that was in 2011. And um, I also kind of, I used to sell cars before I, before I went into the arts or whatever you want to call it, the stupid shit that I do. Um, and I was, I was just around a lot of GEA players because the ones you know, they, they are amateur sportsmen, they're amazing athletes, uh, but they there's, there, there is, a, I suppose, a, an argument that they should be paid, and I, I believe that's, that's true, they should, but they do get, I suppose the way they get away with not paying them is they, they do look after them a bit, and they try and push them in the right directions with jobs and stuff like that, and I think that's the argument, it doesn't really add up to me, they should just be paid for being professional sportsmen that they are, but um. Yeah, I just I just dealt with a lot of GA players over the years in, in banks and uh, and in finance companies and even car salesmen themselves. And I just was around a lot of it and I just saw what the world was like. And I was just fascinated by the fact that these guys were famous and could play in front of 83,000 people on a Sunday and, and could sit opposite me on the break room at nine o'clock on the, on the Monday morning. And I'd, I'd be on the back page of the paper. And I, it just didn't add up to me. And I just wonder what that would do to someone's psyche and ego. And, and that was basically a huge long story of how to explain how I came up with a really silly character he, he's not a silly character and he's definitely how you work through a lot of stuff as is comedy as a whole it's how i definitely deal with my internal struggles and demons so i, I love that comedy is one of the most healing things i ever did in my life i find that fascinating though because i i imagine anyone who's watching from outside of ireland and i do have viewers from outside of ireland is like what do you mean the GEA players don't get paid? They don't. What they do get is this almost elitist type system that kind of pushes them in certain directions and, and gets them seen. It's not even really that. It's kind of, how would you even explain it? Like It's it's not possible to explain it outside of Ireland. Um, I don't want to get into a big feckin no, thing. No. About, no, no, no. But like they, 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 they're professional athletes. Yeah. They train, they're peak physical athletes. But because the organization, I suppose, that, 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 that that heralds over the games, hurling, Gaelic football, camogie. Um, you know, it's it's an amateur organization technically, and uh, yeah, I I don't really understand it myself, but I have a. But all I will say is I have 
the most amount of respect for the the Gaelic Games players. They're just incredible athletes, and they are. The mental strength is just unbelievable. Like it, it really is. Even even yesterday when we were we were shooting some some silly hurling scenes and we were kind of faking some of the stunts and so i don't have no idea how they do it at full contact and physics i'm in bits today and i wasn't even doing anything you know yeah it's true it's a real show of endurance mentally and physically what they do um and it is it's such a strange thing that they yeah. don't it's our, i suppose it's our national sport if, if there is american viewers it's our baseball it's our american football and it's but instead of them getting 100 million dollar contracts they just do it for the for the passion which i suppose is is really really admirable as well you know really beautiful but yeah it would i would imagine play with your head a bit and there would be like you know yeah i can completely understand yeah. him better now myself so i mean that's all that really matters in these yeah, yeah that's gar i actually answered you there like gar I, I'm, I'm finding it hard to let go of him <laughs> Um, you're not meant to let go of him not today anyway um you have two and a half more weeks of needing him to completely yeah. take over sometimes and and that's okay um yeah. yeah sometimes it's really hard to let a character go as well uh they're, they're not meant to they're, they're meant to still be wherever they're supposed to be yeah yeah well we'll see <laughs> so your podcast i love your podcast tell us about your podcast uh, well, I, I I I put the podcast on the shelf during the pandemic. Pandemic. It was called "My Head Is Wrecked" with Tony Kelly. Um, yeah, it was about mental health, recovery, addiction, and stuff like that. But um, and it, look, it was it was wonderful, and it, I you know the feedback that I used to get on it and stuff was great. But um, I just it was twofold really. One one thing was um, I had I had finished up, and the idea was that we I do it in season, so I do like ten episodes in a season, and I did the first season. But what I found was I could go into an interview very hyped and very happy and all that kind of stuff. And then listening to somebody's story of, of whatever had gone on for them mentally or in, in addiction or, or whatever trauma they'd been through. I found it very difficult to not take that on myself. I'm like, you know, I, I feel like what I was doing was the work of a, of a therapist or, or someone that should have been a trained professional. And although I do appreciate people still say to me, it's been two years since I've done it, but, uh, the, the COVID doesn't make it feel that way, maybe, but like I do appreciate that some people would still say to me, you know, it was, it was, they enjoyed it and, and they'd like me to do some more, but it, it just wasn't, it wasn't good for me taking on that kind of stuff, you know? And, and then the second part of it is, is during the pandemic, like myself, I, I started struggling a lot again. And, and, uh, in order for me to do even one more episode of it with someone else, I feel like I'd have to address my own slip during the pandemic and i'm just not ready to do that and that's that's where it's at really to be honest um i think it's fair enough i think it's more than admirable to even realize these things about oneself and to decide to take different journeys and follow our own intuition um so i have no problem with that but i would recommend anyone who hasn't heard it yet to listen back because the ones that i did hear and the ones that are in existence regardless of it going future forward or not are incredibly magical impactful and important thanks Rebecca yeah I appreciate that like and, and I suppose maybe it would be different if I didn't open with my own story the first time um and you know because then I'd, I I feel at least to be truthful and it's it's about I suppose being real and, and like like acting I suppose being truthful and, and being honest and I'd have to do it again and I just I'm just not I'm just not there like like I have no problem saying it like I'm always very truthful and honest in, in interviews and stuff like that like I did an interview with Beat 102 103 southeast of Ireland station here uh for the new year back in January about like resolutions and stuff and I spoke to the the lady who interviewed me is a friend of mine and um we well you know and she she wanted to, she kind of wanted to have a chat about what happened during the pandemic and and kind of use it as a new year, new me hashtag thing going forward for people. And I did it and it really, really, it kind of sent me into a tailspin, to be honest with you. And I had to call her and ask her, would you pull the interview? Thank thankfully it was pre-recorded. And of course she had no problem doing it. But um yeah, I don't know. Maybe look, maybe, maybe someday, maybe the end of the year. I I, I don't know. Maybe there'll be a time that I can I can get ten people to, or nine other people together after I after I talk about my my own my own slip in in, in 2020 and maybe and, you, know, you never have to maybe, and maybe. exactly yeah 
Exactly. Like, like look, genuinely, the ten episodes that are there, Tony, they don't need more, but they, they do. They stand need... alone. Yeah, they stand. They're alone. fine. You did yeah. what you had to do in that moment in time, and I completely relate with the creative process kind of taking a funny turn because I I started writing a book back in October, and I didn't realize that the weight of the words I was going to put in, and it set me back out of recovery. It set me back pretty bad out of recovery for a few yeah. weeks until I realized, wow, what you're actually writing is so dark and so impactful on you still in your own healing that you, you you need to find a way to be able to deal with this or it's going to deal with you and it's not what you want so then I took seven weeks off right in now I'm back on a completely sober level so I get it like it's there's different yeah. reasons and healing is tough yeah it is like and I, I think before uh although I was technically like it's I think anyone who who knows me at all knows that I'm, I'm sober and, and and stuff like that and but I think when I was originally doing my head as a wreck I was chemically sober but I wasn't emotionally sober if, if that, that makes sense to anyone in, in recovery and uh, I think what happened during during the pandemic going back out and you know uh <laughs> seeing as there hadn't left at the end of a glass or or, or whatever else <laughs> uh there was nothing <laughs> there was nothing in a farm and i needed to find that out you know and and look it, it ended up in my opinion being the best thing that could have ever happened to me and and we're here now you know we're making this movie now and a year and a half ago i don't think anyone would have thought that was possible so you know i i probably believed in you then too in fact i'm pretty sure i did i you know you know it's your, it's your job to charm the guests so you have to say that uh you know uh, the, the job of a cheerleader is never done tony kelly mm. uh, so people might not know this but obviously you worked on a documentary called plastic paddy and i find that very 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 enjoyable what an unusual character what an unusual story <laughs> and how impactful and funny it is because that's one of those things i i love most about being irish is how many people just automatically associate themselves with our culture for whatever their reasons i think it's beautiful i think it's majestic that we are such an incredibly inspiring people you know yeah yeah plastic patty uh it's it's really funny uh so it's it's about this guy dominic ruby who, who i met in um in ayanapa in cyprus in 2012 a friend of mine used to own a bar there and i would i spent two summers i would i would I would I would go there during the summer and play guitar and sing songs in in his Irish bar, um, and it was a nice way for me to pay my rent in New York <laughs> for a couple of months, and then also spend some time performing uh, and kind of practicing jokes in between songs and workshopping some stuff, and obviously the weather and the you know and the people you'd meet weren't too bad either over there. But but Dominic was the singer in the in the rival Irish bar, I suppose. Um, the one he the one he was singing in was was more rough and ready or sorry that he, his one was more family orientated very very well designed and put together and aesthetically pretty and the one i played in was more rough and ready it was almost more punk rock it looked like an, a shed that had been kind of excavated and it was a it was a looking back it was it was pretty punk rock and it, it was packed it was it was the place it was it was more of a of a party place than the other place was and uh, yeah, so I just Dominic Dominic had met me, and he he um, he was asking me for some tips, and he was speaking with a very strong Cork accent. And he was like, "No, you know, Tony, this is my first time here in in Ayanapa, like, and I just wonder, would you give me a couple of couple of tips about what to do, like?" And I was like, "Yeah, well, tips. I just played the songs. I didn't know what he was trying to ask me, you know." And and uh, he had a he had a Viking tattooed here, and I think I could be wrong. Maybe the Viking is wa waving an Irish flag or something like that. And I was like, that doesn't really add up to me because. You know the Vikings didn't invent the tricolor. Thomas Francis Marr did, you know. And I, I'm not. Maybe I got that wrong, but in my mind, that's what it was. And he, I remember he had like a lot of just. He was very, very patriotic. I thought and very charismatic as well. Really nice guy. He was fr a friend to this day. I love Dominic. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I guess then it was a couple, of, maybe a couple of weeks even later. Uh, one of the waitresses from where Dominic was working was down in the bar I was in, and I heard us heard about her saying, "Ah, that." fucking German fellow up there. I guess she'd had a row with him or something like that. And I went, uh, what's, what's this? And she's like, oh, that fucking German, Dominic. And I said, uh, all right, so his parents are German, is it? And he's, and she went, no, he's German. He's from Germany. I went, all right, so he's born in Germany. He moved to Cork. And she said, no, he's from Germany. He's not from Cork. That's not who he is. He passes himself off as Irish. And my brain, even saying it now, my brain is scrambling um it's it's one of the most 
amazing things I've ever experienced. So Dominic basically is is from Munich in Germany and just fell in love with Irish culture when he found found Irish culture, I guess, at 12 or 13. And um, has spent a little bit of time here, but not enough to get an accent like he has. It's a genuinely Daniel Day-Lewis or, or a similar actor who is not from Ireland or considers himself Irish could do the accent. You know, I saw John Voight in the general and he didn't have as good an Irish accent as, as Dominic Ruby has. Uh, so I just thought like, and, oh yeah, and he makes a living touring Europe playing Irish traditional music as an Irishman and means it in no disrespect. It's not for money. It's just, he considers himself Irish. He believes, he believes that he was born in the wrong country and, and, and ident he identifies as Irish. Yeah. Yeah. And I just said, I, one day I will make a documentary about this guy. And in 2019, I guess myself and Anthony Courtney, a uh, buddy of mine, we worked on a, on a feature film together. He, he was the cinematographer on a feature that I did in 2017. And me and Anthony flew over to Munich for the weekend and we just we just chatted to Dominic and, and just filmed them walking around Munich. And we made this little documentary about him and it was one of the most amazing things. It's, I put it up on YouTube, I think, during the pandemic and uh, I've forgotten about that. And he's just so enigmatic. I want to do more with him. I'd love to do I'd love to do some more stuff with him because um yeah, the plastic patty thing is just like it's it's said kind of by us as a as a kind of insult or a slight more than an insult, maybe. You know, we use it for Americans who come over here and like I'm Irish, I'm seven tenths Irish. And uh I think for Dominic it's a it's a it's almost like he's one of us, you know. He's a great guy, really great guy. But it's, I think it's a huge, I think it's entertaining. His story is very entertaining. It's entertaining, mind boggling and completely beautiful. Like I can't stress enough how proud as an Irish woman it makes and funny. me. And it's funny. It's funny, yeah. It's all the things it needs to be to be associated with you, Tony Kelly. There is a there is a moment in it and Dominic won't mind me saying, like it's just, I just think it's very funny. There's a moment in it where Dominic is describing his first visit to Dublin when he went on his holidays and he is, he said he somehow found his way to O'Connell Bridge um, without using a GPS or a map. He felt like he was just Led. drawn spiritually to it, that he could automatically find his way around Dublin. Um, and he he directed, someone asked him for directions and he asked, they asked him because he thought he was Irish. He was able to direct them. And for some reason, he just knew where it was. He just knew he, 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 he was not treated as a tourist by these other tourists. And he, he's spiritually Irish. And in the same breath, I then asked him, did he visit the GPO? And he said, no, I couldn't find it. You know, <laughs> and you know, that, that, that type of humor to me is, it is, is my type of humor. I, I love that. It's, it's quite subtle, but it's, um, it's human, you know? It's beautiful. I love that. And obviously you've done loads of stand up and they went viral on their own right and your tours and everything you've done. Um, so I guess I want to bring you back further. So the stuff that I would know of you from 14 year old, 16 year old Rebecca's life, <laughs> you were a musician in actual bands. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I was looking at my guitar and my little ukulele and stuff over in the corner there. Yeah, I suppose that's how I started performing. Uh, I I just picked up, I, I played a little bit of keyboards when I was younger, but I was only talking about this yesterday with Nisha, who's our sound man on, a, on, on The Hurler. He's a piano player. Um, and I was saying, you know, I wish I kept it up when I was 10, but I never did. And then, but, but when I was 14, I picked up a guitar and I haven't put it down since. Um, and I just, yeah, I just, I just wanted to perform. Like I, I thought like at the time I wanted to be a musician, but I was never going to be a musician. And I just wanted to perform, I think. And, I learned to play the bass, sort of like a be in bands, and you know, I, I played bass and I sang in bands. And again, as I said, in in Oyanapa, I had just me and my guitar, and you know, for a while that was what I, you know, it was a nice way to supplement what I was doing with the comedy and the acting and stuff. So, uh, you know, I've played in bars in Toronto and New York and clubs and you know that kind of stuff. And uh, the one thing I wish I could do that I can't even do below average is is write a song. I I would I don't know how to do it, and I have friends who are great songwriters and very well known and respected musicians and I and they're like oh it's easy I'll teach you and I you know I'm still waiting lads I, I you know if I could write an album of songs I think I'd probably just go get a job in a I don't know bank or something I, mean, I couldn't get a job in a bank but you know what I mean I think I'd just be I'd die happy as a creative person if I could write an album now 
It's a weird one. What What do you think it is that's stopping you from creating songs? Is this an idea you have in your head because someone said something at one point? Is it something even more abstract than that? Is it just that when you go to try do it, that connection to source isn't there? Uh, the only way I can describe it is if someone is, is true what I do. So like, it, it'd be like someone... Yeah, I, I, I look, I suppose maybe it's just like... I don't know how to write a melody. I don't know how that works. You know, I've written one or two songs, tried to when I was younger, and it's just like, I don't know. There's Songwriting is a technique and a skill in itself, you know, and I don't know what that is. Like joke writing is a skill in, in itself, you know, and not it's not everyone can write a joke and then there's not everyone can deliver a joke. You know, there's so many different things. And like, there's people who can write songs, but they can't sing the songs. And there's people who can write jokes, but they don't have the delivery. So they are writers. And then there's people who have the delivery, but can't write the joke, like talk show hosts. And to me, it's the same with songs. I can sing other people's songs. I can play. I'm, I I would consider myself a, a good rhythm guitar player. I can't play lead guitar to save my life. I don't know a lot about music theory and stuff like that. But if you tell me the chords of a song, I'll play it and I'll be able to play it forever. Um but I I could not possibly like I was I, I was in New York back in October November and December with and there's a friend of mine Vinny Vinny Caruana and he's a he was in a band called The Movie Life and um and he what's the other one he was in The Movie Life and uh, I can never anyway Vinny was in two really really well known punk bands in the early two thousands and he still tours and. He released um he released an EP called uh, Aging Frontman back in twenty nineteen and it's just it's just class and me and him took a we took a trip out to Montauk it was very romantic actually for me and a married man to do that but uh, <laughs> we went for a hike and it was just really nice but me and Vinny I, me and Vinny went out and he was he was like saying oh I can teach you we you know I'll I'll sit in with you and get your guitar and. You know, I listened to one of his songs that I used in in one of my shows, Ronnie and. I just can't imagine how how to do that. I just don't. I just don't have to sit down and know that, that it's just amazing. And he was like, "Oh yeah, one of the tricks I use is this." And even what he was explaining to me didn't make sense. And I've been playing music for for twenty five years. Yeah, I, I guess it's just that you haven't found out yet how to tap into that side of your creativity. Yeah. But I have absolutely like I I'm in the process of writing a song. Well, the song is there. I'm just waiting for it to come together. But I never thought I would. Mm. and then Maybe. one day it just snapped into place but I remember the first time a song came to me you know that that melody I was mm. pregnant with my son and I'd read about this tribe in Africa who used to go under a tree and pray for a soul to come to them and then a song would descend on them and then they'd hum that song until the child arrived and then during the labor of the song the song would still be there for the child to come into this world and then forevermore that would be that soul's song and I'd had lots of miscarriages before Keanu and I was desperate, desperate, desperate. So I meditated and meditated and one day a song came and it was just this, this, this melody. And then when he was born, all the words were there with him because it's his song. Oh. I think that's where music, it's connecting to a different side of your creativity. It doesn't come from the same place as comedy. Comedy comes from a healing space that's within, whereas music comes from a healing space sent to you. So that's my understanding of it because they're, they're tapping into different senses. Like they both come from a hard place, but they, they, they come differently upon us. Yeah. I, yeah. And I definitely hear that. Definitely. Uh, I think for me as well, though, and just just me, like um, I kind of made peace with the fact that I do this and I do it. Uh, you know a good few things in that realm but i i can't do this and this being the song right now i just i don't think i can and maybe there'll be someday maybe i'll be if i ever make it to being a 60 year old man you know maybe that something will drop but for now i'm just like i'm okay with the fact that i can't do absolutely everything you know what i mean and i'm okay with that and i love music so much like i love it so much that i just like to appreciate what's there you know and there's nothing wrong with that. Music is an incredibly special thing. Um, and even, I, I can't play an instrument, for instance, do you know? That bass in the background, I've only picked her up three times since I was 16, do you know, when I was in a punk band. So like, she looks pretty there, but like, 
when when we'd be down in Garda Lane at uh, what was the thing that was on? What was it called? Teenage Blast? Kicks and Blast. Yeah, there you go. Old school. Old school. I was there. I was there too, Tony Kelly. Rebecca calls me by my, my both my names. <laughs> I can't actually call him anything else. It's impossible. This has been going on for 22 years. It, and you know what's funny, Rebecca, is that like, it doesn't matter where in the world I am or how long I know people. For some reason, everyone calls me by my by Tony Kelly and not just Tony. It's insane to me. My, my grandmother calls me Tony Kelly. I don't know what it is about that name. I don't know what it is. What do you remember? You posted up a picture of your passport. I don't know. Was it about two years ago or something? And the I, realization that your actual name is Anthony Kelly sent me into a spin so badly. I had to message you and go. I had never ever realized that your actual yeah, name. It's I no. It's and you know what's what's really annoying about that is that like my name is not Anthony Kelly. Like nobody has ever 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 called me that. My my mother got me christened. Tony and then the priest wouldn't do it because of Catholicism which is great um, yeah the priest said um, and I almost see it as a comedic scene but my mother was like she's like what, what are you christening a child and, he, and she said well you know Tony and he went oh I don't know any Saint Tony you know so she's like, he's like well my mother was like well my, my child's name is Tony he said I'll christen him Anthony to be called Tony and I will say that on the altar but because there's no Saint Tony, I won't sign that document, Saint Tony. So the priest decided that I couldn't legally be called Tony, which is insane to me. But I've never been called Anthony. The only person that ever called me Anthony was this, the the career guidance teacher in the school that I went to, who didn't, who wasn't my biggest fan, and he knew it would annoy me. And he would, you know, <laughs> when he was coming in taking role or whatever, he'd say, um, you know read the names and go Anthony Kelly and I would just sit there silently looking at him and he'd just sit there silently looking at me and eventually just go Tony I know you're here and I go yeah you know so that's the that's the journey I've been on well I think Tony Kelly suits you perfectly and <laughs> I will continue calling you Tony Kelly all of the time for that's as okay. long as I know you that's okay girl that's okay <laughs> Um, yeah, so in a weird twist of fate, I ended up being in the background of your beautiful movie this week, and that yeah. made me really happy. In fact, you don't know this, but at one point I was sitting down and I've been dreaming of uh, sober, old fashioned, right? I've just been like, I really want an old fashioned because it really reminds me of someone that I lost recently. And I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking about this old fashioned and one of the girls goes, oh, that's just peach iced tea in this whiskey glass. So I had my silver iced tea in this glass and I got my, my, my really good moment. It just felt so good to feel like the universe had given me the thing that I had been searching. So as what's well. In an, what's in an old fashioned? What is that? Oh, it's like whiskey, bitters and a twist of orange. But orange. Uh, I have this... Um, for Trinity's for story, I, I would have been working with Mark Lanigan and Joe Cardamon in October. And I didn't know when I was going to meet Mark Lanigan. And I was ruffled beyond belief at the fact that I would one day meet him. And I'm sitting in a restaurant and he rings Joe and he's like, where are you? And he's like, I'll meet you later. No problem. And there's this woman behind me with a baby crying. And I go over to see if she's okay because she's crying. And she explains to me that she has a new baby and she's heartbroken. And her husband leaves and he goes back up to the room and she taps on my shoulder and she goes, do you want this old fashioned? Because I'm not going to drink it and my husband's gone back up to the room with the baby. And at the very same time I get handed this old fashioned to calm my nerves like the universe sent it to me, Mark Lanigan walks through the door. And if it wasn't for that drink, I don't think I would have had the calm connectedness to actually do that but then since I've gone sober again I just missed them and it was just nice to be in a situation where I felt that moment was still there that's awesome so you're sober now yeah completely have I was for two full years then I decided that I should play around with it for 10 months and see how I felt about it and that 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 you know that's like that's that I mean that's playing with fire Tony Kelly like I mean you know, there might get a point where you're like, yeah, you know, maybe I've healed this. No, it, it turns out if you're allergic to alcohol, that's a, a lifelong thing. Yeah. 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 Learn yeah. Yeah. Can, can vouch for that. But no, I just wanted to ask about what's in the old fashioned because when I was when I was drinking, I didn't have the patience to sit there and wait for them to make it for me. I just wanted whatever was easiest to just get into me. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I think my my dark days is definitely led by alcohol, but it's not the way that a lot of alcoholics maybe would have it. There's a switch goes off in me and it could happen after one sip. It wouldn't necessarily drink for days on end and not be able to stop. It's just a switch that goes off and changes my personality completely. Yeah, I think there's a different Zoom meeting we could go to and talk about that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am sober, Tony Kelly, so I don't have to worry about that. (laughs) So you have two and a half more weeks of this. Is there anything you want to request from anyone who's watching? Any help or like, are you looking for anything? Um, Background people like me. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, we we have another nightclub scene on on Monday, tomorrow, Easter Monday. Um, But it won't be as, as kind of... That's, it won't be as big and kind of scoby as before it's really we just need the people to fill a dance floor but we, I think I guess because it's Easter Monday it could be could be nice and fun um, and then next Saturday um, which is let me get my calendar here on this laptop next Saturday is the 24th that's uh, that's a pretty big day for us it's it's the it's the county final day in the in the script and we would love to try and make it look as big as possible. So people want to be hurlers on the teams um, or spectators or whatever. We're going to be in Passage East, in Passage uh, Hurling Club, uh, which is just in a beautiful spot. And for me, it was important for us to film there because the first stuff we ever shot for the hurler was shot in Passage. You know, Nikki Quinlan, a old school friend of mine, ho- hooked me up there. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's definitely important to remember where you came from, who helped you along the way and, and try and call back to that when you can, even if it's only a comedic call back, you know, it's important to just, it's important to honor stuff like that. But yeah, look, we're happy. We're happy to kind of just like have anyone who wants to help out, come along and, and, and be there, you know, or if you, if you ever wanted to know what it's like to work on a film set, you think you need an extra pair of hands come down. You know, it's, it's a very community based thing that we're doing. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because, the cast is so diverse and like talented and well known and internationally known. And then behind the scenes, the, the local community spirit that has gotten this off the ground is actually really, it's actually really moving to be honest with you not to be fucking lamenting about it or anything, but like Jim Gordon, who everyone will know as flash is, has just been, has just been unbelievable and all this, you know, and, and, and Eddie Mulligan as well, um, local councillor. Both of those men, you know, believed in me enough and believed in this project enough after seeing the play and the web series and my, my stand-up career and my acting career and stuff and believed that I could do this and, and put everything behind me, put everything behind me to do this. And then from there, I suppose, the local restaurants, like this week we were fed by Loco here in Waterford, Bodega, Revolution, um, Oscars, even McDonald's here in Waterford, you know, uh, helped us out. And then the, the hotels, like the Granville Hotel, Dooley's Hotel, the Tower Hotel, next week the Fitzwilton Hotel get involved, you know. And it, to me, it's just mind blowing, you know, the spirit of community. So like, if you're out, if you're listening to this, like, and, and you want to, you know, you want to see how a film set works, you'd like to be, you know, you want to, you want to help us in any way, come down, you know, there's, there's, there's room, there's room there, you know, if you want to stand in the background, you want to see what it's like to be in a movie scene, come down, we'll put you in somewhere. You know, a lot of my family wanted to do stuff. And yesterday I got a chance to put my granddad into the, into the film, you know, he's 80 years of age now and he made his feature film debut yesterday. And, um, my aunt Brenda was there. She got herself a line and my, her husband, Frank, my uncle, you know, he's a big hurl and a GA man. Anyone who's into that would know Frank Ryan and, you know, Frankie got a nice close up yesterday. And uh, yeah, that's what it's about for me. You know, it's, it's about that. Look, the main cast is there and they are, you know, David McSavage, John Kenny, Elva Trill, Sophie Vavasour, the, these people will sell the movie on their own and they'll show up with their work to be done. And then like, it's about then after that, like just kind of making it happen, you know, and, and letting people kind of be a part of it if, if they want to be, because I've, and look, I feel like if, when I was, when I was selling cars, dreaming about going to film school and dreaming about doing something, uh, I would have loved it if there was something in Waterford that I could have went in and just sat and watched or, you know, um, but I don't know, maybe I'm talking absolute bullshit. Maybe I don't know. 
you know, I think that's great. I think it's amazing. The community spirit that's been shown to you in this moment in time. I think it's great to give. Well, no, that part is definitely not bullshit. That part is absolutely. No, no. But I think it's also great to do it in the home time. I, I do think that there are a lot of opportunities that Waterford doesn't get because it doesn't get seen because it's kind of the forgotten city. So it's nice yeah. for someone local to go, hey, I have this opportunity and I want to bring it back here. Well, that's the thing. Like we, we, this, you know, this was not supposed to be, but like this was very close to being shot in Kilkenny. And um, what? Why would we go twenty five minutes up the road? So when when everyone kind of rallied around me, I like I saw like look at what the young offenders has done for Cork, you know. And I don't just mean since it you know bridged over to BBC and became this juggernaut. I mean just when it was a a movie that they made for sixty or eighty grand and. And um, went on to to become such a huge juggernaut. It put it put Cork on the map, fil- film wise. And I, you know, I'd I'd love to give Waterford the chance to do something similar. You know. Well, we have an incredible um, film festival here. We have an incredible film uh, center. Incredible videographers. So many wonderful. Anyone, just everyone, everyone here. You know what I mean. So why not why why not get productions to start coming here? You know, and we beyond the talented people, world class people that we have here in Waterford. We have world class scenery. We have world class sets w- just there, you know. Have you seen our walls? They're literally painted. Like yeah. some of them are so old that they're here from the first city settlement in the whole entire country. Like literally, literally, we're the oldest city in Ireland. How we're not seen as the most majestic place on earth is still beyond me, but we're working. We get there. We get there. We get there. We will. Is there anything you'd like to add to the interview before I stop recording, Tony Kelly? I don't think so, girl. To be honest with you, like I just, I'm, I'm honestly just absolutely wrecked. I'm, and you know, we're only a week in, and but it's been the build up. You know, as I said, this has been four years in the making. But beyond that, it's been, you know, since December, I suppose it's been nonstop for me with this. Um, and then after this, then we'll wrap. You know, little break maybe straight into the edit. Um. And then hopefully I'll finally get back to my first love then after that and, and do a new stand up show, which is the which is the plan after that. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you so much for the opportunity of both being in the background of your film and being able to speak to you about your wonderful journey. Anytime. Anytime, Rebecca. <laughs>